trying to refute him as far as the validity of who he said he was and his ministry. And ultimately, in John chapter 8, Jesus Christ looks at them and he says the following. These are Jesus' words himself. He said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your fathers ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh uh, of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. In other words, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, however you want to call him, he is the author, he is the originator, he is the founding father of lies and deception. Amen. That is what Jesus Christ himself said. There is no truth in him. So when he starts to question the Bible, then you need to say, stop right there. There's no truth in you to begin with. Amen. You are the founding father of lies. Right. Let me go this, take this a step further. In Titus chapter 1, verse 2, in my opinion, this is one of the most profound statements you'll ever read in the Bible. In Titus chapter 1, verse 2, it says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, cannot lie, promised before the world began. Now, I want to focus on the way this is worded. It did not say God chooses not to lie. Because if it said God chooses not to lie, it means that he could have if he wanted to. It says God cannot lie. He Amen. does not even have the ability to lie in his very essence, in the very fabric of his being. He cannot even lie. Amen. He can't do it. So you have Satan who is the father or the author of lies, and you have God who cannot lie. 2 Timothy chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 tells me all scripture. Well, what is that? When I say all scripture, what is it that we're referring to? We're referring to what is called the Holy Bible. Amen. God's word from the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, God is the author. He is the founding father of all scripture. So if God cannot lie, and it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, then it's, it's very simple for me to say that it's true. It's absolute truth. It says that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I can take it to the bank that what I am reading in the Holy Bible is truth because God cannot lie. Amen. He is not the author of lies. The devil is. So if God cannot lie and all scripture is authored by him, then whatever you read you can take it for what it says. Amen. Now that does not mean I'm going to stand here and tell you that I understand every concept that there is in the Bible. No man can say that. Because if you could, you'd be God. No man can sit here and say, I understand every single verse in the Bible. You can't say that. But God has arranged it so that there are certain concepts that are as easy as pie, so to speak, that a child can understand. And salvation right. is one of them. There are other concepts that you have to be a little more spiritually mature and you have to study and you have to study and you have to study and you have to meditate in order to get these concepts as you go in your Christian life. But there are certain concepts that are simple or easy as pie, as we say. But all Scripture, regardless of how simple or how difficult it may be for us to wrap our heads around it, all of it is true. Amen. Now, how do I know that? You can ask somebody who's watching this and say, well, I'm still skeptical. How can you really know that? I'll tell you how I know that. Because I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and personal Savior. Amen. And the day that I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior, the third person of the Godhead, i.e. the Holy Spirit, came and resided within me. And if you look at the latter half of 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, it says, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness. You'll notice that the word spirit is capitalized. So who are we referring to? We're referring to the Holy Spirit, i.e. God. God bears witness with who? With what? He's bearing witness with me and because the Spirit is truth. I can take this book 
over any college text that's ever been written, over any book of philosophy that's ever been written, over any science book that's ever been written, I can take this as absolute truth and none of that. Because God is true. Let God be true and every man alive. Amen. All right? I wanted to say that. I wanted to stress this because everything that we're going to read and everything we're going to study going forward, you're going to have the sense. You're going to have the skeptics. You're going to have people who say, I don't believe that. Well, they cannot believe it all they want to. It doesn't change the fact that it's true. Amen. And, and what we know as is the dark ages, there was a time when humanity thought that this planet was flat instead of spherical. Well, the fact that they thought that the planet was flat, did it change the fact that the earth was still spherical? No. It just was the fact that they were ignorant. They didn't know any better. And by the same token, people can scoff and make fun of us as born-again Christians. It doesn't change the fact that I'm still dying and going to heaven when I leave this place. Now, they may have a different set of circumstances, but it doesn't change my eternal destination. So what do I care? Are you with me? We shouldn't care if people make fun of us. You know why? Because I'm in his hands. And he's the one who's going to judge me. And not any man, or woman, or child that's ever born on this earth. They're not going to judge me when I die. So what do I care what they think? I'm in his hands. And his own. Alright? So, with that in mind, we're now going to take a look at uh, this wonder, this most wondrous man-made structure, Noah's Ark. In Genesis chapter 6, we're going to read, starting with verse number 1. We'll read through verse number 8. It says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Now I want you to hear this. Yet his days... It'll be 120 years. God has created an ultimatum here. He's giving an ultimatum. My spirit's not going to always try with man. And I'm giving him T minus 120 years. Here's the reason why. Starting with verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And in verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was, what's the next three words? Only evil continually. What a sad commentary on the state of humanity in verse 5. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Verse 8, but no. Found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now let me paint the picture, again, for benefit of those who may see this someday. Let me paint the picture here of where we are at this point in Genesis chapter 6. We know in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we are given the creation of this universe. And again, I will stress that all Scripture is authored by God, and God cannot lie. Amen. So in chapters 1 and 2, we are told how everything came into existence. It did not start in the beginning, there was a big bang. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Our existence, this universe's existence, is all the handiwork of the Almighty God, not a big bang that can't even explain how it started. It came from God Himself. Amen. Chapters 1 and 2 deals with the creation of the universe in these six days, of course, the creation of Adam as well, and then later on, God giving him a woman from, one of the, from part of his flesh, literally, and made Eve from Adam. We know that. We know that Adam and Eve is there in the Garden of Eden during the time of dispensation that we call the Age of Innocence. I do not believe, personally, that the Age of Innocence was a long duration there in the Garden of Eden. I believe, I would submit to you that it was less than a year that Adam and Eve were there in the Garden of Eden. It was a very short period of time that they lived in a state of innocence. Why? Because in Genesis chapter number 3, we see where Satan himself has infiltrated into the Garden, takes possession of a creature that we know of as the serpent, which is different from the modern day snake that we know of today, but took possession of this creature called the serpent, 
deceived Eve and tempted her into taking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She took of it, Adam saw that, and he willfully ate of it after she had done so. Thus brought sin into the world and the fall of man. We see the results of that in chapter 3. When man fell, he was no longer part of the age of innocence and God transitions humanity into the second dispensation or age that we know of as the age of conscience where God says, I will let humanity's conscience be his guide. Remember, there is no formalized government yet. There is no law yet. God says, I will allow humanity to let his conscience be his guide. And let's see where that goes. Now, God didn't take it by surprise. He knew where it would go. But he let man's conscience dictate to him what he thought was right in his own eyes as far as what he would or would not do. May I say to you that when you look at the end result of the age of conscience, in chapter 4 we get the story of Cain and Abel, chapter 5 we have the genealogy of humanity up to this point, but when you get to the, the culmination of chapter 6, where the culmination of the age of conscience, we see that humanism is dead wrong. Humanism is a teaching that is aligned and well today that says man is evolving, man is advancing, Man is getting better, and eventually man will become a god in his own right, because we just keep getting better and better. I beg your pardon. That's not right. Oh, amen. And you can see it here in the book of Genesis. By the way, later on I'll show you how long the age of conscience lasted. They had a lot of time to try to get that right, and they failed miserably. But in Genesis chapter 6, we see that the thoughts of man was only evil continually, and it literally made God so sick that he's like, you know what, I'm sorry, I didn't even make it. What a sad commentary that God himself even looked at humanity and says, if I'm repenting, I'm sorry, I didn't even make it. Yeah. How pathetic at this point. Now we get to verse 8 where we see where Noah finds grace in the eyes of God, and we know that God tells Noah, Noah, I am going to bring a universal judgment onto humanity and this planet in T minus 120 years. As a result of that, I want you to create a vessel that will be called an ark. And here we have some specifications about that vessel. Now, God didn't say, Noah, I want you to build a boat. Well, how long? Don't worry about it. You just figure it out yourself. What am I supposed to make out of it? Don't worry about it. Just figure it out. No. God was very specific in what he wanted to do and how he wanted to do it. He said, no, I want you to build an ark. I want you to build it 450 feet long. I want it to be 75 feet wide. I want it to be 45 feet tall. He was very specific in the proportions of this vessel. He also, later on, he says, I want you to make it out of gopher wood. Now, there's some debate as to what gopher wood actually was. You have some Bible scholars that say that there was actual gopher wood tree. You have other Bible scholars who say that that was another word for cedar. Others say it was cypress. Some say it was pine. But regardless of what gopher wood actually was, God was specific. You used this type of tree to build this vessel. He didn't leave it up to no one to figure that out. He told him specifically what type of wood, how long, how tall, and how wide. When you take a look at this vessel, and the reason why I chose this as the most wondrous man-made structure in the Bible, look at the dimensions of this. It was taller than a three-story building. The deck area of Noah's Ark was the size of 20 standard college basketball courts. That's pretty big, as far as the deck area. When you look at the cubic volume of this vessel, it's over one and a half million cubic feet. To put that in perspective, that's the equivalent storage space of 569 modern-day railroad boxcars. Imagine you come to a railroad crossing, the, the bells and the red lights are whist, uh, going off and the arm comes down and you have to sit there and watch 569 railroad cars go by before it finally stops. That's a lot of boxcars, is it not? This is the storage space that Noah's Ark had, over one and a half million cubic feet. Okay? Now, I found this interesting. I discovered this on the internet. Dr. Crusher, I don't know, maybe you've heard of this gentleman before, but there was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Hong, and Dr. Hong has a BS degree in naval architecture from Seoul National University and a PhD degree in applied mathematics from the University of Michigan. Dr. Hong, who does not profess to be a Christian, by the way, makes no profession to be a Christian. 
Dr. Hong decided that he would conduct a test to see the seaworthiness of the ark based on the dimensions that Noah built it. <coughs> what he found was fascinating in that he looked at maximum comfort, maximum stability, and maximum strength. And when you look at the dimensions of the ark, it fit dead center. It was perfect for comfort, <coughs> stability, and strength. And he predicted that the ark could handle waves as tall as 100 feet in height. Now think about that. So God did not just arbitrarily and eh, just make it eh, 450 feet, that's all right. No, God knew exactly the dimensions he wanted it to be. Because he knew exactly how large this vessel had to be to maintain stability, strength, and comfort for the passengers and the cargo on that vessel. Dr. Hong proved it in the test that he conducted. I thought that was pretty interesting. Amen. Now, one of the big arguments that the skeptics and the cynics and the people who don't believe in the Bible, they're going to say, there's no way that the ark was large enough to accommodate all the animals that were necessary to be on board that vessel. It's just, that, that's not possible. Well, I found it interesting when I did some research on this that there was a, a taxonomist by the name of Ernest Mayer who has passed away recently. But Ernest Mayer was a leading taxonomist, and he discovered there was approximately one million species of animal life on planet Earth. Obviously, we've had a number of species become extinct over the centuries, but he deduced that there was about one million species of animal uh, species on the planet Earth. When he did his breakdown to determine which ones would be required to be on the ark, he basically looked at it like this. Which ones live on dry ground? which ones need air to survive, and which ones cannot live for sustained periods of time in water. That's the criteria. When he broke it down, he was like, well, obviously the fish don't need to be on the ark. They live in the water. He went on further. He said, well, there's a number of different life forms that live in the sea, like sea anemone, mollusks, starfish, a lot of invertebrates that live in the sea. And he continued, he went on and he gave all these different numbers of species of fish and mollusks and all of these other different names that I can't pronounce all that well. But 30,000 protozoans, which are microscopic single-celled life forms that live either in the air or the sea. He said all of these, they wouldn't have to be on the ark. It wasn't necessary for them to be there. He went on further and elaborated that there's a number of other animals, such as mammals that are aquatic, whales, dolphins, porpoises, those are animals that didn't have to be on the ark. He said that other animals that didn't have to be there are like sea turtles. Sea turtles wouldn't have to be on the ark. They live the majority of their life in the sea. He even said that alligators and crocodiles didn't necessarily have to be on the ark because they spend most of their time in the water. They could survive, they could float on the surface of the water for an indefinite period of time. He basically went through all of these different species, and I was shocked that there's 838,000 different species of arthropods. I had no idea of that. But he broke all of this down to say the vast majority of life on this planet survives in water or could survive for extended duration in water. So when he broke it down, with the assistance of doctors Morris and Whitcomb, who wrote the book The Genesis Flood, they state that basically you can look at as few as 35,000 individual animals have to be on the ark, maybe as high as 50,000. Only 35 to 50,000 was to be required to actually be on the ark out of all the species of life that exist on this planet. When they broke it down, they said that only about 37% of the ark would be required as far as them living on board the vessel only 37%. The remaining 63% can be used for personal living quarters, uh, storage bins for the food. I would even say walking trails. The animals, they gotta, they, gotta, they got to exercise their leg muscles every now and then, don't they? They got to stretch their legs. Who knows, there's probably a walking track on the ark so the animals could stretch their legs because they were on the ark for an extended period of time. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Here's the other qualm that people have. A lot of evolutionists, a lot of people who don't believe in the Bible. 
There were no dinosaurs on the ark. Yes, there was. They didn't exist 65 million years ago, as evolutionists would have you believe. The universe hasn't been around that long. Amen. How do I know that? What the Bible teaches. Amen. Oh, you brought the Bible up. Yes, it did, because God wrote it. Yeah. And he's true. He can't lie. I'm not going to, I can't stress that enough. If he can't lie, who's lying then? You following what I'm saying? Man tells me the universe has been around for billions of years. God says, no, it hasn't. It's only been around for several thousand years. Who am I going to believe? A fallible man who can make a mistake or a perfect God who makes no mistake? Amen. Who am I going to believe? You tell me. I'm going to believe God. Yeah. It's only been around for several thousand years. Well, they'll say, well, not that sort of one. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. They were alive and well during this time. So they'll say, well, Teddy, let's assume you're right. Well, how in the world did he get all those big brachiosaurs and T-Rexes and all these other big, giant dinosaurs on board the ark? Well, bear in mind, what was the purpose of the animals being on the ark anyway? The purpose for them being on there is so that when they got off the ark, they would repopulate their species. You don't need grandma and grandpa dinosaur on the ark. They're not going to be interested in doing that. You need the juvenile age dinosaurs so that when they reached adolescence, when they got off the ark, they would be ready to reproduce. So when you look at the dinosaur species that are massive in size, when they are young, when they're juvenile age, they're very small. They do not get that massive growth spurt until they reach puberty. Ask a paleontologist. A paleontologist will admit that. They will tell you that. Even if they believe in evolution, they'll say, yeah, you're right. When they, they didn't become massive until they reached puberty. So these animals that he's putting on the ark, even the dinosaur species, they didn't have to be massive in size. In fact, and personally, you can kind of take this with a grain of salt. They say that the average size of a dinosaur was about that of a horse. I read, frankly, I don't know how you compare a brachiosaur to, to a dinosaur that's about the size of a chicken. I don't really know how you can make that average comparison, but that's what they say. That the average size of a dinosaur is about that of a horse. Okay, so if they're about the average size of a horse, they're not taking up a lot of space, are they? Not on this vessel. So only about 37% of the space was actually used to accommodate the animals. The rest is open space for Noah and his family to do with. I'm saying all this to say this. God knew what he was doing. Amen. God knew exactly how large this vessel needed to be so that there's also breathing room to spare. God's not stupid. Amen. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. Okay. Now, what was the purpose of the ark? Why did God even have him build it? God was sending a flood. He was sending a judgment upon mankind for his sin and his continual wickedness before his face. So the purpose of the ark was for safety for Noah and his family. That told eight individuals, eight human beings that would be spared from the flood. Safety for these land animals that we've already elaborated on that needed to be on the ark, two of every unclean species, seven of every clean species, and of course to escape and have safety during God's global judgment in the form of the flood. Here's a question that people, you know, I, Brother Brush, I know that you have done these lectures and things of this nature over in the Philippines and probably here in the United States. If you was to ask somebody, how long was the flood, you may get a knee-jerk reaction of 40 days and 40 nights, right? Sometimes you'll get that knee-jerk reaction. Well, it was 40 days and 40 nights. No, that's how long it rained yeah. upon the earth. 40 days and 40 nights. Well, how do I know how long Noah, or how do I know how long the flood lasted? Well, if you look in Genesis chapter number 7, if you look with me in verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven, heaven were open. So in the 17th day of the second month of the 600th year of Noah's life is when the flood began. Well, when did they get off the ark? When was the flood over? If you look at chapter 8, starting with verse 13, it says it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month of the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold the face of the ground was dry and then in verse 14 in the second month on this uh, 27th day of the month was the earth dry and God spake unto Noah saying go forth of the ark. So how long was the flood? 
The second month of the 17th day of the 600th year is when the flood began. The 601st year of the 27th day of the second month is when Noah and his family was told to get off the ark and take the animals with him. All told, one year and ten days. That's how long the flood lasted on this earth. One year and ten days. Not 40 days and 40 nights. Substantially long. I want to, this is not in the slides, but I want to have this little tangent here, if I may. Let me chase this rabbit. When Noah and his family got off the ark, do you remember what they did? They made a sacrifice to God, did they not? They offered a sacrifice unto God as thanksgiving for them surviving this flood. If you look in chapter 9 of Genesis, starting with verse number 11, I want to, I want to look at this. In verse 11 it says, And I will establish my covenant with you. Now this is God speaking. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud. That's a rainbow. I do set my rainbow in the cloud. And it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Okay. You will have people who say that they're a Bible scholar. Who will say that Noah's flood was a localized event. Okay. God just said, here's a rainbow. No one, had, no one had ever seen a rainbow before. They'd never seen a rainbow before until the flood. But they had certainly never seen a rainbow before. before. They get off the ark. God said, boom, here it is. Here's a rainbow. And this is my sign. This is my covenant between you and the rest of humanity and every living thing on this earth. I will not destroy it for the flood again. Question. If the flood was a localized event, why do we still have floods today? In the last decade, you can think of hurricanes. Like Hurricane Katrina. Who, who can't remember that? Hurricane Katrina hit uh, the Gulf Coast of the United States, devastated New Orleans, devastated the Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, and all of that section of the Gulf, Gulf Coast. There was, it was flooded. You think about the city of New Orleans, how it was flooded. You think about it in the early 90s, 93 or 94. We had some major flooding down in southwest Georgia, around the Albany area. You remember that? Think about, I know the Prussians could think about this too, about the Philippines. The Philippines had some flooding recently. You think about the major earthquake that hit Japan recently, and that tsunami that hit Japan and literally came in and devastated cities and villages and just literally swept it out of the sea as if it never existed, just wiped off the face of the earth, and unfortunately thousands of people with it. Let me ask you a question. Are those not floods? That's a simple yes, isn't it? Those were floods. If Noah's flood was a localized